Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste. We carry forward our discussion on the conservation laws and in this lecture, we will have a look at the AIR Act. The preamble of the AIR Act says, the AIR Prevention and Control of Pollution Act 1981, Act number 14 of 1981. It was enacted on 29th of March 1981. So, the, the full name is the AIR Prevention and Control of Pollution. So, similar to the Water Act, it is trying to prevent pollution and control pollution of air. An act to provide for the prevention, control and abatement. So, abatement as we have seen before is reduction. So, prevention, control and reduction of air pollution for the establishment with a view to carrying out the aforesaid purposes of boards for conferring on and assigning to such boards powers and functions relating thereto and for matters connected therewith. So, essentially the preamble is very similar to what we have seen in the Water Act. Just like the Water Act, it is trying to prevent, control and abate the pollution, in this case the air pollution, establish boards for carrying out these purposes and conferring to them and assigning to them powers and functions, so that they can do these jobs. Whereas decisions were taken at the United Nations Conference on the Human Environment held at, in Stockholm in June 1972, in which India participated to take appropriate steps for the preservation of the natural resources of the earth, which among other things include the preservation of the quality of air and the control of air pollution. So, it is again referring back to the Stockholm Conference of 1972, in which the Prime Minister of India had participated. And whereas it is considered necessary to implement the decisions aforesaid in so far as they relate to the preservation of the quality of air and control of air pollution, be it enacted by parliament in the 32nd year of the Republic of India as follows. If you look at the arrangement, this act comprises of seven chapters, preliminary, central and state boards for the prevention and control of air pollution powers and functions of the boards, prevention and control of air pollution, funds, account and audit, penalties and procedure and miscellaneous provisions. So, these are the seven chapters of this act. Now, let us look at these chapters one by one. The first chapter preliminary, section 1 as always it is short title extent and commencement. So, this act may be called the Air Prevention and Control of Pollution Act 1981. So, in short, we refer to it as the AIR Act of 1981. It extends to the whole of India and it shall come into force on such date as the central government may by notification in the official gazette appoint. And this date is 16th of May 1981, wide this notification dated 15th of May 1981. So, it comes into force on this date, 16th of May 1981. Section 2 as always comprises of definitions. In this act, unless the context otherwise requires, air pollutant means any solid, liquid or gaseous substance including noise present in the atmosphere in such concentration as may be or tend to be injurious to human beings or other living creatures or plants or property or environment. So, in the Water Act, we had looked at pollutant and it was defined in terms of water. In this case, we are defining air pollutant and it is in terms of air. So, any solid, liquid or gaseous substance including noise that is present in the atmosphere which contains the air. Now, this substance must be present in such concentration as may be or tend to be injurious either to human beings or living creatures or plants or property or environment. So, if you have an air pollutant and the concentration is very low, 
the concentration is so low as not to be injurious, then it will not be classified as air pollutant. It has to be in a high enough concentration. Air pollution means the presence in the atmosphere of any air pollutant. Approved appliance means any equipment or gadget used for the uh, bringing of any combustible material or for generating or consuming any fume, gas or particulate matter and approved by the state board for the purposes of this act. Approved fuel means any fuel approved by the state board for the purposes of this act. So, what it is referring to here is that certain fuels are going to be approved so that they do not release a large amount of air pollutants. Automobile means any vehicle powered either by internal combustion engine or by any method of generating power to drive such vehicle by burning fuel. Board means the central board or a state board. Central board means the CPCB constituted under section 3 of the Water Prevention and Control of Pollution Act 1974. So, when we are talking about central boards in the context of Air Act, it is the same CPCB that was created under the Water Act. Chimney includes any structure with an opening or outlet from or through which any air pollutant may be emitted. Control equipment means any apparatus, device, equipment or system to control the quality and manner of emission of any air pollutant and includes any device used for securing the efficient operation of any industrial plant. So, it is a very wide definition of a control equipment. Emission means any solid or liquid or gaseous substance coming out of any chimney, duct or flue or any other outlet. So, anything that is coming out whether it is solid, liquid or gaseous through any outlet it is an emission. Industrial plant means any plant used for any industrial or trade purposes and emitting any air pollutant into the atmosphere. Member means a member of the central board or a state board as the case may be and includes the chairman. Occupier in relation to any factory or premises means the person who has control over the affairs of the factory or the premises and includes in relation to any substance the person in possession of the substance. So, we have seen this definition before, it is the, the same definition that was there in the Water Act as well as in the Environment Protection Act. Prescribed means prescribed by rules made under this act by the central government or as the case may be the state government. State board means in relation to a state in which the Water Prevention and Control of Pollution Act 1974 is in force and the state government has constituted for that state a state pollution control board under section 4 of the act, the said state board. Meaning that if the Water Act is in force in a state and using the Water Act, the state has constituted a state pollution control board. So, this same board will be applicable in the case of the Air Act as well. And in relation to any other state, so a state which has not uh, ta uh, taken into force the Water Act, so for that act, uh, for, for that state, the State Board of Prevention and Control of Air Pollution constituted by the state government under section 5 of this act. So why this distinction? Because we had seen that in the case of the Water Act, the central government did not have sufficient powers to enact it and so it made use of uh, article 252 of the constitution and a few states in all their houses they passed this resolution that the central government should make that act and when the central government makes an act using this provision then that act is only applicable to those states that had asked for it or those states that later on through a resolution say that okay this act should be applicable in our state but not in the other states. Whereas, in the case of the AIR Act, the central government had the powers to enact it. It did not have to ask any state government. However, the central government while making this act considered that if a state has already made a state pollution control board under the Water Act. So, in that case, the powers and privileges and functions of the uh, state board under the AIR Act could be entrusted to that board. Whereas, if a state had not made a state pollution control board, so in that case, the state should be asked to make a new board which is referred to here. So, in this case, the state board 
is in the case of state where water act is applicable it's the same state pollution control board and in any other state the state board of prevention and control of air pollution that is constituted under section 5 of this act which is why we have these two provisions then chapter 2 deals with central and state boards for the prevention and control of air pollution central pollution control board so it says that the uh, cpcb constituted under section 3 of the water act shall without prejudice to the exercise and performance of its powers and functions under that act that is under the water act exercise the powers and perform the functions of the cpcb for the prevention and control of air pollution under this act so this section section 3 is saying that the cpcb constituted under water act will also take care of air pollution under this act there will not be a separate cpcb for this purpose and state pollution control boards constituted under section 4 of the water act are going to be the state boards under this act so in any state in which the water act is in force and the state government has constituted for that state a state pollution control board such state pollution such state board shall be deemed to be the state board for the prevention of uh, for the prevention and control of air pollution constituted under section 5 of this act and accordingly that state pollution control board shall without prejudice to the exercise and performance of its powers and functions under that act exercise the powers and perform the functions of the state board for the prevention and control of air pollution under this act so the same state pollution control board made under the water act has been given the powers and functions under this act now section 5 says constitution of state boards in any state in which the water act is not in force because that state had not asked for the water act to be made and it has also not uh, ratified or uh, resolved that the water act is going to be applicable in that state so in those states where water act is not in force or that act is in force but the state government has not constituted a state pollution control board under that act then the state government shall with effect from such date as may be by notification in the official gazette appoint constitute a state board for the prevention and control of air pollution under such name as may be specified in the notification to exercise the powers conferred on and perform the functions assigned to that board under this act so if you have not the uh, the water act in force in your state or if the water act is in force but you have not constituted a state pollution control board then under the air act you have to constitute a state board and a state board constituted under this act shall consist of the following members so then it lists the members that are going to be there in the state board and we have seen similar provisions before so we will skip this now central board to exercise the powers and perform the functions of a state board in the union territories no state board shall be constituted for a union territory and in relation to a union territory the the central board shall exercise the powers and perform the functions of a state board under this act for that union territory provided that in relation to any union territory the central board may delegate all or any of its powers and functions under this section to such person or body of persons as the central government may specify so section 6 is saying that for a union territory you don't need another board the cpcb is going to perform the functions but the central government may specify and in that case the cpcb may delegate all or any of its powers and functions to such person or body of persons as the central government will specify then it talks about the terms and conditions of service of the member so if the state board is constituted under this act so in that case these provisions are going to apply then it talks about disqualifications no person shall be a member of a state board constituted under this act who or at any time has been adjusted insolvent or is of unsound mind and has been declared so by a competent court or has been convicted of an offense which in the opinion of the state government involves moral turpitude or at any time has been convicted of an offense under this act 
So basically, we we are looking at nearly the, the same provisions as they were there in the Water Act. And uh, here, uh, section uh, uh, subsection two says the state government shall, by order in writing, remove any member who is or has become subject to any disqualification mentioned in subsection one, provided that no order of removal shall be made by the state government under this section unless the member concerned has been given a reasonable opportunity of showing cause against the same. So here again, we are looking at the principle of natural justice. Nobody will be uh, condemned unheard and there has to be an opportunity of hearing and presenting his case. And notwithstanding anything contained in subsection 1 or subsection 6 or section 7, a member who has been removed under this section shall not be eligible to continue to hold office until his successor enters upon his office or as the case may be for renomination as a member. So once you are disqualified, you have been removed, in that case, you are not going to continue till a successor is appointed. So you are removed with immediate effect and you cannot be renominated as a member ever. Then section 9 deals with vacation of seats by members. If a member of a state board constituted under this act becomes subject to any of the disqualifications specified in section 8, his seat shall, shall become vacant. Then section 10 and further now we are uh, looking at the procedural aspects, meetings of the board. For the purposes of this act, a board shall meet at least once in every three months and shall observe such rules of procedure in regard to the transaction of business at its meetings as may be prescribed. Provided that if in the opinion of the chairman, any business of an urgent nature is to be transacted, he may convene a meeting of the board at such time as he thinks fit for the aforesaid purpose. So you have to meet at least once in every three months, but there can also be emergency meetings. Copies of minutes of the meetings under subsection 1 shall be forwarded to the central board and to the state government concerned. Then it gives the board the power to constitute committees and we have seen this before in the Water Act as well. So a board may constitute as many committees consisting wholly of members or partly of members and partly of other persons and for such purpose or purposes as it thinks fit. So it can have several committees. A committee constituted under this section shall meet at such time and at such place and shall observe such rules of procedure in regard to the transaction of business at its meetings as may be prescribed and the members of a committee other than the members of the board shall be paid such fees and allowances for attending its meetings and for attending to any other work of the board as may be prescribed. So the board has the power to constitute committees. Then temporary association of persons with board for particular person uh, purpose. A board may associate with itself in such manner and for such purposes as may be prescribed any person whose assistance or advice it may desire to obtain in performing any of the functions under this act. Now, when we in all of these sections, we are saying as may be prescribed, meaning that later on there has to be a section to say that somebody will have to make rules to give these prescriptions. Now, this section is saying the board can associate with itself in a manner for such purposes as may be prescribed any person whose assistance or advice it may desire. So basically, uh, the persons that are um, asked to associate with the board generally comprise of scientists or expert members or uh, members of the NGOs because the board wants their assistance or advice. A person associated with the board under subsection 1 for any purpose shall have a right to take part in the discussions of the board relevant to that purpose but shall not have a right to vote at a meeting of the board and shall not be a member of the board for any other purpose. And a person associated with a board under subsection 1 shall be entitled to receive such fees and allowances as may be prescribed. Then section 13 looks at vacancy in board not to invalidate acts or proceedings. So if there is a vacancy in the board, we have looked at uh, situations where seats become vacant, they do not invalidate the acts or proceedings. So just because the board is not completely full does not mean it cannot perform its functions. 
Then section 14 looks at member secretary and officers and other employees of the state boards. The terms and, th and conditions of service of the member secretary of a state board constituted under this act shall be such as may be prescribed. The member secretary of a state board whether constituted under this act or not shall exercise such powers and perform such duties as may be prescribed or as may from time to time be delegated to him by the state board or its chairman. And subject to such rules as may be made by the state government in this behalf, a state board whether constituted under this act or not may appoint such officers and other employees as it considers necessary for the efficient performance of its functions under this act. So basically the, the state board also has the power to appoint officers and employees subject to the rules that are made. The method of appointment, the conditions of service and the scales of pay of the officers other than member secretary and other employees of a state board appointed under subsection 3 shall be such as may be determined by regulations made by the state board under this act. Meaning that the state board also has the power to regulate the method of appointment, conditions of service and scales of pay of officers other than the member secretary. So it has pretty broad powers because it can ask, it can form subcommittees, it can ask anybody to get associated as an expert member or as an NGO member, it can even appoint employees and officers. It can decide what is going to be the method of appointment, what is going to be the terms of service, what is going to be the pay of uh, the, the people that are appointed. So it has pretty broad powers. So basically what we are seeing here is that the central government is making all the boards very powerful so that they are able to discharge their functions properly. Then subsection 5 says subject to such conditions as may be prescribed, a state board constituted under this act may from time to time appoint any qualified person to be a consultant to the board and pay him such salary and allowances or fees as it thinks fit. So not only can you appoint employees, but you can also appoint consultants and pay them such salary and allowances or fees as it thinks fit. Then section 15 looks at delegation of powers. A state board may by general or special order delegate to the chairman or the member secretary or any other officer of the board <coughs> subject to such conditions and limitations if any as may be specified in the order such of its powers and functions under this act as it may deem necessary. So it can even delegate its powers either to the chairman or to the member secretary or to any other officer of the board. And then those people will have to perform those functions. So what are those powers and functions? So section 16 says functions of the central board subject to the provisions of this act and without prejudice to the performance of its functions under the water act the main functions of the central board shall be to improve the quality of air and to prevent control or abate air pollution in the country in the water act we were concerned with the quality of water and here we are concerned with the quality of air and prevention control and abatement of air pollution in the country in particular and without prejudice to the generality of the foregoing functions the central board may so it is saying that to perform these functions, the central board may do all these things as are specified, but without prejudice to the generality of the foregoing functions, meaning that apart from these, it can also do other things as it thinks necessary. Advise the central government on any matter concerning the improvement of the quality of air and the prevention control or abatement or of air pollution. So it has an advisory role plan and cause to be executed a nationwide program for the prevention, control and abatement of air pollution. Coordinate the activities of the state and resolve disputes among them. Provide technical assistance and guidance to the state boards. Carry out and sponsor investigations and research relating to the problems of air pollution and prevention, control or abatement of air pollution. Perform such of the functions of any state board as may be specified in uh, and order made under section 2 of section 18, plan and organize the training of persons engaged or to be engaged in programs for the prevention, control and abatement of air pollution on such terms and conditions as the central board may specify, organize through mass media a comprehensive program regarding the prevention, control 
और अबेटमेंट ऑफ एयर पोल्यूशन कलेक्ट कंपाइल एंड पब्लिश टेक्निकल एंड स्टैटिस्टिकल डेटा रिलेटिंग टू एयर पोल्यूशन एंड द मेजर्स डिवाइज फॉर इट्स इफेक्टिव प्रिवेंशन कंट्रोल और अबेटमेंट एंड प्रिपेयर मैनुअल्स कोड्स और गाइड्स रिलेटिंग टू प्रिवेंशन कंट्रोल और अबेटमेंट ऑफ एयर पोल्यूशन ले डाउन स्टैंडर्ड्स फॉर द क्वालिटी ऑफ एयर कलेक्ट एंड डिसमिनेट इन्फॉर्मेशन इन रिस्पेक्ट टू मैटर्स रिलेटिंग टू एयर पोल्यूशन परफॉर्म सच अदर फंक्शंस एज मे बी प्रिस्क्राइब एंड द सेंट्रल बोर्ड मे इस्टैब्लिश और रिकोगनाइज अ लेबोरेटरी और लेबोरेटरीज टू इनेबल द सेंट्रल बोर्ड टू परफॉर्म इट्स फंक्शन अंडर द बोर्ड एंड अंडर दिस सेक्शन एफिशियंटली एंड द सेंट्रल बोर्ड मे delegate any of its functions under this act generally or specifically to any of the committees appointed by it and do such other things and perform such other acts as it may think necessary for the proper discharge of its functions and generally for the purpose of carrying into effect the purposes of this act meaning basically that the board is having a very wide range of powers it has advisory powers it has powers to set standards it has power to train people it has power to engage in mass media so so that people know about air pollution it can publish documents and so on so it has been given all of these powers but then finally it says it can also do any other thing that it thinks fit and it can also delegate any of these powers to one, one or more of the subcommittees that it has made so it has pretty wide ranging powers to ensure that it is able to do its function properly then similar to the central board we also have functions of the state boards and they also have very detailed functions then section 18 talks about power to give directions in performance of its functions under this act the central board shall be bound by such directions in writing as the central government may give to it and every state board shall be bound by such directions in writing as the central board or the state government may give to it so the central board is working under the directions of the central government the state board is working under the directions of the state government but the state board is also working under the directions of the central board provided that where a direction given by the state government is inconsistent with the direction given by the central board the matter shall be referred to the central government for its decision so who is going to decide which is to be followed the central government and where the central government is of the opinion that any state board has defaulted in complying with any directions given by the central board under subsection 1 and as a result of such default a grave emergency has arisen and it is necessary or expedient so to do in the public interest it may by order direct the central board to perform any of the functions of the state board in relation to such area for for such period and for such purposes as may be specified in the order so if the central government thinks that the state uh, that the state board is not doing its functions properly it is not complying with the directions of the central board and has resulted in a an emergency situation so in that case the, the central government will direct the central board to perform the functions of the state board so the central board in these cases may take up some or all of the functions as are specified by the central government and whenever the central board is performing the functions of the state board it is going to recover the expenses together with interest so it's not going to do things for free it is going to recover its expenses and for the removal of doubts it is hereby declared that any directions to perform the functions of any state board given under subsection 2 in respect of any area would not preclude the state board from performing such functions in any other area in the state or any of its other functions in that area so basically if the central board has been give, has been asked to take over some functions of the state board in some area the state board cannot say that okay now the central board is taking care of things so i can sit easily i don't have any functions so this is what this explanation is saying that even when the central board has taken up the powers and functions of the state board in certain area then the state board has to perform all the functions in the other areas as are not mentioned in the order and even in the area concerned if some functions have been given to the central board the state board is still required to perform its other functions so that is the explanation it gives then chapter 4 deals with prevention and control of air pollution
power to declare air pollution control areas. So we had seen before that there are water pollution control areas in the Water Act and here it's talking about air pollution control areas. The state government may after consultation with the state board file notification in the official gazette and declare in such manner as may be prescribed any area or areas within the state as air pollution control area or areas for the purpose of this act. And the state government may after consultation with the state board by notification in the official gazette alter any air pollution control area whether by way of extension or reduction declare a new air pollution control area in which may be merged uh, one or more existing air pollution control areas or any part or parts thereof. And if the state government after consultation with the state board is of the opinion that the use of any fuel other than an approved fuel, we had looked at approved fuel uh, before in the definitions, in, the, in any air pollution control area or part thereof may cause or is likely to cause air pollution, it may by notification in the official gazette prohibit the use of such fuel in such area or part thereof with effect from such date not uh, being not less than three months from the date of publication of the notification as may be specified in the notification. The state government may after consultation with the state board by notification in the official gazette direct that with effect from such date as may be specified therein no appliance other than an approved appliance shall be used in the premises situated in an air pollution control area provided that different dates may be specified for different parts of an air pollution control area or for the use of different appliances. And if the state government after consultation with the state board is of the opinion that the burning of any material not being fuel in any air pollution control area or part thereof may cause or is likely to cause air pollution, it may by notification in the official gazette prohibit the burning of such material in such area or part thereof. So what we are observing here is that similar to the case of the water pollution control areas, we also have air pollution control areas. But in the case of water pollution control areas, the state government had the power to say that the Water Act will only be applicable in these areas and not in other areas. Here the state government does not have that power. Here the Air Act will be applicable everywhere, but in the case of air pollution control areas, the state government can put up more stringent measures. So it can say that such fuel will not be used or such appliances will not be used as are not approved. So that is a major difference between the water pollution control areas and the air pollution control areas. Then section 20 talks about power to give instructions for ensuring standards for emission from automobiles with a view to ensuring that the standards for emission of air pollutants from automobiles laid down by the state board under clause G of subsection 1 of section 17 are, are complied with, the state government shall in consultation with the state board give such instructions as may be deemed necessary to the concerned authority in charge of registration of motor vehicles under the Motor Vehicles Act 1939 and such authority shall notwithstanding anything contained in that act or the rules made thereunder be bound to comply with such instructions. Meaning that to ensure the standards of emission from automobiles, this act is also giving power to the state government to give directions to the authorities in charge of registration of motor vehicles under the Motor Vehicle Act. So they can give directions that if the automobiles are not following these emission standards, then they are not going to be registered or their registration has to be cancelled. So all these instructions can also be given. So the Air Act is giving powers in other domains that the Motor Vehicles Act was not touching in those days. Then restriction on use of certain industrial plants subject to the provision of this section, no person shall without the previous consent of the state board establish or operate any industrial plant in an air pollution control area. Meaning that if the air pollution control area has been uh, demarcated, so in that case of establishment or operation of any industrial plant has to be done with the previous consent of the state board because the government here is saying that in these areas the level of pollution is high and so if you want to set up any new thing you will have to take prior permission. If you have to continue using things, you have to take permission. Then section 22 talks about 
persons carrying on industry etc not to allow emission of air pollutants in excess of the standards laid down by the state board so here a duty is being given to the persons who are carrying on industry etc not to allow emission of air pollutants in excess of the standards now we have seen before that if there is a duty there will also be a penalty for not doing the duty so in this case what is happening is that certain offenses are now being defined offenses are being defined because duties are being defined so if the duty is not being done then there is an offense and then there will be a penalty so these are now the substantive provisions of the act no person operating any industrial plant in any air pollution control area shall discharge or cause or permit to be discharged the emission of any air pollutant in excess of the standards laid down by the state board then power of the board to make application to court for restraining persons from air pollution so the board is also given the power to approach courts for restraining orders and uh, these orders uh, on receipt of the application under subsection 1 the court may make such order as it deems fit now where under subsection 2 the court makes an order then what kind uh, kind of things can be there in the order it may direct such person to desist from taking such action as is likely to cause emission so it may ask the person not to do certain things and it may also authorize the board if the direction under clause a is not complied with by the person to whom the direction is issued to implement the direction in such manner as may be specified by the court so the court can also give other powers to the board if the court is giving this restraining order and all expenses incurred by the board in implementing the directions of the court under clause b of subsection 3 shall be recoverable from the person concerned as arrears of land revenue or of public demand so when the court is giving this direction the state board will follow these directions ensure that uh, all these uh, restraining orders are put into action and any expenses that are incurred by the board to do this will be recovered from the person concerned so here we are seeing that earlier also we had looked at the principle of polluter pays so here as well if there is a polluter and if there is an expense of money to stop that polluter the cost of stopping that polluter will be recovered from the polluter himself and in this manner as arrears of land revenue or of public demand then section 23 says furnishing of information to the state board and other agencies in certain cases where in any area the emission of any air pollutant into the atmosphere in excess of the standards laid down by the state board occurs or is apprehended to occur due to accident or other unforeseen act or event the person in charge of the premises where such emission occurs or is apprehended to occur shall forthwith intimate the fact of such occurrence to the appre uh, or the apprehension of such occurrence to the state board and to such authorities or agencies as may be prescribed so if something is going wrong in your premises you have to tell the state board and other agencies and on receipt of information with respect to the fact or apprehension or any occurrence of the nature referred to in subsection 1 whether through intimation under that subsection or otherwise the state board and the authorities or agencies shall as early as practicable cause such remedial measures to be taken as are necessary to mitigate the emission so they'll take remedial measures and here as well expenses if any incurred by the state board authority or agency with respect to the remedial measures together with interest so it will recover the expenses and also the interest from the date when a demand for expenses is made until it is paid may be recovered by that board authority or agency from the person concerned here again we are looking at the polluter pays principle as arrears of land revenue or of public demand then it also gives the power of entry and inspection subject to the provisions of this section any person empowered by a state board in this behalf shall have a right to enter at all reasonable times with such assistance as he considers necessary any place for the purpose of performing any of the functions of the state board for the purpose of determining 
whether and if so in what manner such perf uh, such functions are to be performed or whether any provisions of this act or the rules made there under or any notice order direction or authorization served made or given or granted under this act is being or has been complied with so you can also enter to check if the orders have been complied with for the purpose of examining and testing any control equipment industrial plant record register and so on so you can check everything if things are working properly or not checking the records every person operating any control equipment or any industrial plant in an air pollution control area shall be bound to render all assistance to the person empowered and if he fails to do so without any reasonable cause or excuse he shall be guilty of an offence under this act so now it is putting a duty on every person operating any control equipment and we have seen before that control equipment has a very broad definition and every person operating any control equipment or any industrial plant in the air pollution control area is bound to render all assistance and if he does not render all assistance then he shall be guilty of an offence under this act if a person willfully delays or obstructs any person empowered by the state board under subsection 1 in the discharge of his duties he shall be guilty of an offence under this act and the provisions of crpc are going to apply so whenever we are talking about search or seizure then this act is not giving uh, these procedures in big detail but it is saying that crpc is, go is going to apply then it also gives the power to obtain information so the purpose is of carrying out the functions entrusted to it the state board or any officer empowered by it in that behalf may call for any information from the occupier and occupier as we have seen before is the person who is in actual um, control of the premises or of the pollutant or has manage managerial roles there so he has a control over that facility or any person carrying on any industry or operating any control equipment or industrial plant so the board can or the board or the officer empowered can also ask for information and this information has to be provided then it has power to take samples of air or emission and procedure to be followed this is very similar to the procedure we saw before in the case of the water act so before carrying uh, before taking any sample a notice has to be served and the sample has to be collected in the presence of the occupier or his agent except in cases where the person willfully absents himself or says that he is not going to sign if he re refuses to sign the marked and sealed containers so except in those cases it has to be uh, put into containers it has to be sealed and it has to be signed both by the officer and the occupier or his agent next section 27 deals with report of the results of analysis on samples taken under section 26 so who does the analysis the laboratory established or recognized by the state board the uh, analysis is done uh, the the report of the analysis is made in triplicate one copy of the report shall be sent by the state board to the occupier or his agent referred to in section 26 so that person also gets a copy of the report another copy shall be preserved for production before the court in case any legal proceedings are taken against him and the other copy shall be kept by the state board so these are the three copies now uh, here as well any cost incurred in getting any sample analyzed at the request of the occupier or his agent as provided in clause d of subsection 3 of section 26 or when he willfully absents himself or refuses to sign the marked and sealed container or containers of sample of emission under subsection 4 of that section shall be be payable by such occupier or his agent and in the case of default the same shall be recoverable as arrears of land revenue or public demand then section 28 talks about the state air laboratory so air laboratories are set up then section 29 talks about analysis now all these provisions are very similar to that of the water act the report of the analysis and appeals so there is also a, a a good mechanism of an appellate authority then section 31a talks about power to give directions not withstanding anything contained in any other law but subject to the provisions of this act and to any directions that the central government may give in this behalf a board may in the exercise of its powers and performance of its functions under this act 
issue any directions in writing to any person, officer or authority. And such person, officer or authority shall be bound to comply with such directions. So it has very wide ranging powers to issue directions. It can issue directions in writing to any person, officer or authority. And it includes the powers to direct the closure, prohibition or regulation of any industry, operation or process. So it can ask for an industry to be closed or it can ask for the stoppage or regulation of supply of electricity, water or any other service to ensure that the industry is closed. So these are pretty wide and pretty strong powers. And then section 31b talks about appeal to the NGT. Then for carrying out the purposes, there is also fund and it has to be accounted for and audited. So chapter 5 deals with fund accounts and audit. <coughs> Contributions by central government. The central government may after due appropriation made by parliament by law in this behalf make in each financial year such contributions to the state boards as it thinks uh, necessary to enable the state boards to perform their functions under this act. So it is not talking about contributions to the central board. Here it is talking about contributions to the state boards because this is an act made by the central government. Then the board is going to have a fund, the board has the powers to borrow, the board has to make an, a budget, the board has to have an annual report and uh, the annual report has to be there for both the central board as well as the state board. The central board shall during each financial year prepare in such form as may be prescribed an annual report giving full account of its activities under this act during the previous financial year and copies thereof shall be forwarded to the central government within four months from the last date of the previous financial year and that government shall cause e every such report to be laid before both houses of parliament within nine months of the last date of the previous financial year. So it is also talking about a timeline. So the annual report has to be made within four months from the last date of the previous financial year meaning uh, 31st of March. So April, May, June and July. Only these four months are there. And then within nine months from the last date of the previous financial year, the report has to be placed before both houses of the parliament. And similarly, in the case of the state board, here also the, the timelines are the same, four months and nine months, and it has to be laid before the state legislature. So what we are seeing here is that the parliament as well as it's the state legislatures are going to have a pretty good idea about what is going on in the central boards and the state boards. So when we talk about democracy, the elected representatives need to have this information so as to ensure that the government is only working as per the wishes of the people. And so we have these provisions. Now because we have funds, so there will be accounts and audit and then chapter 6 deals with penalties and procedure. Now, as in the case of the Water Act, it prescribes different penalties for different contraventions. So in certain cases, the penalty is one year and six months, but may extend to six years. Fine, which may extend to 5000 rupees every day. In uh, certain other cases, it is uh, imprisonment for a term not less than two years, but which may extend to seven years and with fine. So all of these different sections are dealing with different kinds of contraventions and the penalties. Now, as before, in the case of companies, the head of the company is held responsible together with any director, manager, secretary or other officer of the company. So all of these people are held liable if there is a contravention. And similarly, in the case of government departments, the HOD is held liable together with any other officer who had a, a con connivance. But at the same time, in both these cases, if they are able to prove that all the precautions were taken, all due diligence was taken or the uh, contravention happened without their knowledge, then they will not be held liable. Then protection of action taken in good faith, no suit, prosecution or other legal proceedings shall lie against the government or any officer of the government or any member or any officer of or other employee of the board in respect of anything which is done or intended to be done in good faith in pursuance of this act or the rules made thereunder. 
then we have cognizance of offenses no court shall take cognizance of any offense under this act except on a complaint by a board or any officer authorized in this behalf by it or any person who has given notice of not less than 60 days in the manner prescribed of the alleged offense and of his intention to make a complaint to the board or the officer uh, authorized as aforesaid and no court inferior to that of a metropolitan magistrate or a judicial magistrate of the first class shall try an offense uh, punishable under this act. So, it is putting restrictions about who can put uh, uh, a case in the court. So, only the board or an officer authorized by it or any person, but this person will have to give a notice of not less than 60 days. And uh, it also restricts the jurisdiction of the courts. So, no court inferior to that of a metropolitan magistrate or judicial magistrate first class shall try an offence under this act. And when a complaint has been made under clause B of subsection 1, the board shall on demand by such person make available the relevant reports in its position to that person. Provided that the board may refuse to make any such report available to such person if the same is in its opinion against the public interest. Now, this clause is there so that people do not misuse these provisions for their own commercial gains. So, one company cannot ask for the reports of another company to be used in a court just to pester the other company. It is only in the cases of public interest that this information has to be provided by the board. Then section 44 talks about members, officers and employees of board to be public servants under the IPC. Then we have reports and returns. The central board shall in relation to its functions under this act furnish to the central government and a state board shall in relation to its functions under this act furnish to the state government and to the central board. So as we had seen before, the state board is working under the, the directions both of the state government and the central board and so it has to furnish its report and returns also to both these bodies. Reports, returns, statistics, accounts and other information as that government or as the case may be the, the central board may from time to time require. Bar of jurisdiction, no civil court shall have jurisdiction to entertain any suit or proceeding in respect of any matter which an appellate authority constituted under this act is empowered by or under this act to uh, determine and no injunction shall be granted by any court or other authority in respect of any action taken or to be taken in pursuance of any power conferred by or under this act. So, if somebody is aggrieved, he or she has to approach the appellate authority. He or she cannot approach a civil court to get another order. Then chapter 7 deals with miscellaneous provisions power of the state government to supersede the state board. If at any time the state government is of the opinion that a state board constituted under this act has persistently made default in the performance of its functions or that circumstances exist which render it necessary in the public interest to do so. So, what can the state government do? It may by notification in the official gazette supersede the state board for such period not exceeding 6 months as may be specified in the notification. And here as well, provided that before issuing a notification under this subsection for the reasons mentioned in clause A, the state government shall give a reasonable opportunity to the state board to show cause why it should not be superseded and shall consider the explanations and objections if any of the state board. Again, the clause of audi alterum partum. Upon the publication of a notification under subsection 1 superseding the state board, all the members shall as from the date of supersession vacate their offices as such. All the powers, functions and duties which may by or under this act be exercised, performed or discharged by the state board shall until the state board is reconstituted under subsection 3 be exercised, performed or discharged by such person or persons as the state government may direct. All property owned or controlled by the state board shall until the board is reconstituted under subsection 3 vest in the state government. And on expiration of the period of supersession specified in the notification, the state government may extend the period of supersession for such further term 
not exceeding six months as it may consider necessary or reconstitute the state board by a fresh nomination or appointment as the case may be and in such case any person who vacated his office under clause a of subsection 2 shall also be eligible for nomination or appointment so it is not restricting the persons for a renomination or a re appointment provided that the state government may at any time before the expiration of the period of supersession whether originally specified in subsection 1 or as extended under this subsection take action under clause b of this subsection meaning that if the board has been superseded then it can be superseded for six months at a time this period can be extended and after this period uh, has elapsed or even before the state government can again create a state board so this is what this section is saying then section 48 special provision in the case of supersession of the central board or the state boards uh, constituted under the water act where the central board or any state board constituted under the water act is superseded by the central government or the state government as the case may be under that act all the powers functions and duties of the central board or such state board under this act shall be exercised performed or discharged during the period of such supersession by the person or persons exercising performing or discharging the powers and duties of the central board or such state board under the water act during such period so because these boards are common so if under the water act there is a supersession then it will automatically mean the supersession in the case of the air act and the same persons will have to uh, perform the uh, duties under this act as well then dissolution of state boards constituted under the act so there can also be a dissolution then uh, section 50 has been omitted then section 51 talks about maintenance of register every state board shall maintain a register containing particulars of the persons to whom consent has been granted under section 21 the standards for emission laid down by it in relation to each such consent and other particulars as may be prescribed and this register shall be open to inspection at all reasonable hours by any person interested in or affected by such standards for emission or by uh, any other person authorized by such person in this behalf meaning that every the permission that has been given by the state board it has to be written down in a register together with the standards that were prescribed and this register is an open document so every uh, any person can see this document so it creates a sort of openness in the system then effect of other laws save as otherwise provided by or under the atomic energy act 1962 in relation to radioactive air pollution the provisions of this act shall have effect notwithstanding anything inconsistent therewith contained in any uh, enactment other than this act then power of the central government to make rules so we have seen before that uh, as may be prescribed so when we say as may be prescribed somebody will have to prescribe those things so it says that, that the central government can make rules for n number of things interval time and place of meeting fees and allowances manner in which persons can be associated and so on and similarly the state government also has the power to make n number of rules so here are all different rules that can be made by the state government so essentially what we have seen here is that the air act it came after the water act it took over some of the provisions of the water act so a large number of those provisions are very similar and if the central uh, and because the central board has already been uh, created under the water act it gives the responsibilities under this act to the same board and similarly in the case of the states if the state pollution control board has been established then it gives the powers and functions under this act to the same board if uh, those boards have not been established then it says that okay the states have to create a board to control air pollution and then it it defines offenses it prescribes punishment for them and it entails all different kinds of procedures and we have seen that uh, the powers that are given under this act are pretty wide ranging power and pretty strong powers so as to ensure that the air is not polluted and if in case there is any pollution that is happening then the pollution is contained 
controlled in a short period of time and it is reduced. So that's all for today. Thank you for your attention. Jai Hind.